Hi folks, hope you're okay today, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. Um, don't forget my website, jasonburnspreacher.com, uh, Facebook and Twitter, uh, just type in Twitter, Jason Burns Preacher, you'll be able to get my Twitter. Uh, I just want to, I've just got to go to the doctors to get a repeat prescription, so I'm not happy about it, uh, but I've got to go. It kind of keeps relapsing, keeps coming back, one minute I'm okay, next minute I'm not, so... <clears throat> I'm not happy about coming out today, it's a really bad day. But uh, I just want to quickly talk about uh, the origins of the Quran. I've been reading a book by Ibn Warwick, who's edited a number of academic articles from the 19th century up to the mid 20th century. Um, basically, this is a critical scholarship of the Quran. And. Uh, I've been reading the book, as I've been reading the book, I've also been looking at the Islamic sources. Um, so not just listening to Ibn Warwick, but also going to um, other sources, the Muslim sources, uh, and just studying it in depth. Uh, one thing about um, this book is, I've heard it said that it's a very critical book of the Quran, and therefore we shouldn't really take its scholarship seriously and it's like fringe scholarship, critical fringe scholarship, very biased. My response to that is when you look at the history of scholarship on the Quran, uh, there's been reluctance in the West by academics to be critical of the Quran, to be critical of its sources, to be, to be critical of its textual veracity and development. Um, there's been a reluctance and a kind of willingness to accept the Islamic point of view without any real critical analysis. Um, there are exceptions to the case, but generally there has been, especially in the last 50 years, a kind of post-colonial revisionism that wants to uh, it, it kind of wants to, um, academics want to bend over backwards, please, in the Islamic world, because Western academics feel guilty of the colonialism of the 19th century of the British Empire and the European empires. So the many Western academics want to uh, stay away from being critical of Islam in any way. Uh, and, and, and flagellate themselves, whack themselves over the head and say we are the baddies, we, we Western academics are the baddies because we, we come from a culture that had colonialism that dominated you Muslims and we're sorry for that. And because of this kind of uh, sycophantic uh, attitude by many academics, <coughs> progress... <coughs> 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 in academic studies on the Quran has been very very slow so for example uh, in textual criticism there's very virtually very very little study being done or being done in that area there are a few exceptions there is uh, the uh, Conopia uh, which is a uh, uh, Quranopia I think it is or Conopia is a it's a German website which is trying to, by scholars, are trying to collect various historical sources and match it with the Quran. And it's a massive work that's being done. But generally speaking, there's a lot of reluctance to actually do the critical analysis of the Quran. There are some books that have come out recently, last few years, that are leading the way, but some of them are seen as fringe and um, generally they're not particularly accepted uh, in the academic world. So there's a massive brick wall of political correct scholarship in Western academia that is not pulling its weight. You know, it's, the Bible has had 300 years of massive critical assault. The Quran has not had that yet. So anyhow, so anybody who says that 
Ibn Warwick's book, The Origins of the Quran, is biased. Well, hey ho, so is Western academia, post colonial academics biased. So maybe in the in the middle, there's the truth. So maybe reading both sides, we find the truth. Maybe I believe um, very strongly in going back to the sources. I like to go back to the original sources. So I don't just listen to Ibn Warwick or any other scholar. I will go and look at the sources myself. So while I've been reading this book, I've been going to the hadiths, I've been going to the Islamic web websites, I've been checking the Islamic scholars, I've found Isla other Islamic scholars who've written on this topic who I need to be reading, which I'm going to be reading, and, and I'm going back to the sources themselves. So what have I found? What is my investigation revealing? And this is not just reading Warwick it's, uh, and, and these articles, but it's also going back to the sources. Well, in the compilation of the Quran and back to the sources, I read about 20 hadiths and there are some serious issues concerning the compilation of the Quran. Uh, in some sources it says Abu Bakr, um, Abu Bakr collected uh, the uh, the Quran. Now, it's, what's interesting is he was never given any authority by Muhammad. Secondly, there are sources that say it was Umar's idea, and sources say that it was uh, Abu Bakr's idea. So, there's already when we look at the early sources on the compilation of the Quran, there's already conflicting stories, conflicting issues. Okay, there's, there's contradictions within the sources. So immediately that's telling you that there's something not quite reliable about these early sources about the compilation of the Quran. And it gets more, I mean, um, there's one story where Uthman, uh, I, I, I think it was, it's, no, I think it's Abu Bakr was asked the people uh, should we do this compilation of the Quran and the people said yeah so again that's another conflicting story was it Abu Bakr, was it Umar or was it the people <coughs> and if it was the people what authority did they have to compile the Quran so there's real problems with the early stories of the compilation of the Quran in these hadiths. Now I haven't had time to check whether they're Shia or Sunni or whatever. I've just gone through them all. Uh, and then, then there's a, a large chunk on Islamic websites that talk about contradictions in stories and anomalies in stories. And there's a whole bunch of hadiths that I've not even read yet that even are worse and show up the problems of this historical story of the Quran being compiled. Um, then on the issue with Uthman, who did the next, did another compilation, oh yeah, the Abu Bakr, it seems to be um, that it, it wasn't uh, a public Quran, it was more for private use. So there are issues there concerning what was the issue about Abu Bakr uh, creating uh, a Quranic manuscript from all the various so-called sources that that it was written on, like sticks and stones and bones and whatever. The second thing is, is the compilation from sticks and stones and bones. I mean, the story is ridiculous. Uh, to say that the Quran was preserved by memory isn't true because there's a hadith which talks about it was compiled on sticks and stones and bones. What that tells me is is there was no real planning involved in the early development of the Quran. It was it was ad hoc. So what that tells me is that later historians have, have tried to redact back into the history of the Quran that it was like a very methodical, organised, clear-cut development of making the Qur'an a text. Whereas actually, because it was written on sticks, stones and bones, it gives it away that it was actually ad hoc, it wasn't planned, it, it was all over the place, and so there would have been quite easily uh, issues concerning 
um, losing text, losing passages, and there are scholars uh, in the Middle Ages uh, whose name I can't remember, but there is one particular scholar, but there are scholars that actually say that there, that there are parts of the Quran missing. So, you know, so you can see that with the argument, uh, the finding sticks, finding it on sticks, stones, and bones. The next issue was, is about Uthman. Now, Uthman, uh, the story, the Islamic story is that there were seven ways of recitation and different ways of reciting, and there were arguments about this, and so. Uh, Uthman made one recension, burnt all the rest, and that's how we have the Quran today. Now, I've heard Muslims say it was just about seven arguments about recitation, so there are no textual variants. In other words, there are no texts where there are other ancient Quranic texts, this is the Muslim perspective, that have differences. Because Uthman seven, had seven ways of, pron of pronouncing the Quran, reciting the Quran, but made one recension, one Quran, and then burnt the rest. But it was all about recitation, different dialects of recitation. and So that's the Muslim perspective. Now, there's something suspect about that that I've always thought is why did he make a text? If it's only about recitation and he's made one text, how can one text have seven different ways of rec recitation in? So there's some kind of problem with this this so I did the research and then I found a hadith which says Uthman says he was not happy with the recitations and they brought he asked them to bring what they had and they brought it on skins so it's not just about recitation, it's about text. And then he told them to get rid of what they had, blot out what they had, because he's made what, what, what is needed. So these are clear evidences that it's not just about recitation. Uthman was making a recension, he was making a text, because the text that Abu Bakr did, and others of his time, Abu Bakr's time, was not properly done, that there were issues in it, that there were textual variants in it. So Uthman had to clean it up, had to clean the text up. And this is clear evidence within the Hadith. So, um, so I did a lot of work, I did a lot of reading the other night, I did a heck of a lot of reading on uh, on the hadith I read about 20 hadith but I I, I kind of meticulously went through them I, 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 I kind of like really really read them critique like studied them in depth and that's my conclusion so basically uh, the Quran that we have today looking at the evidence of Abu Bakr and looking at the evidence of Uthman uh, is not the original Quran of Muhammad. What we have, from what I've studied so far, is that there were there was no real one Quran, and um, and the Quran that we have today is the production, the combined production of Abu Bakr and Uthman and maybe other people who edited it and added to it. So the Quran is not a revealed book; it's just an edited compilation. Of fragments, some of them, um, who knows where they came from, but are fragments that were put together by these guys, and you know, that's the reality of it. It was not a book that came down from Angel Gabriel, it's just a, a, a mishmash of edited material that's been put together. And it gets worse because um, we haven't got into the politics yet, but there's a lot of politics between Abu Bakr, 
Ali, Uthman, people being assassinated, wars. So for like 300 years of, of the early history of Islam, there were different groups vying for each other for power in the Islamic world of the time. And many of these caliphs had influence on the editing of the Quran. And many of the scholars were taking sides. So not only do we have the early issues of the editing of the Quran with Abu Bakr and Uthman, we also have a lot of political stuff going. I, I don't know a lot about it, to be honest. I've read a bit about Ali and a bit about Uthman and a bit about Abu Bakr, but I've got to do a lot. I've got to start the scholarship on the history of these guys. But at the moment, I'm just doing the scholarship on the early hadiths. But there is a lot of political stuff that influenced the production of the Quran. And uh, Ibn Warwick touches on this. That uh, a lot of scholars, in order to uh, buttress their jurisprudence, their views of the law, and how to use Sharia law, they had to invent certain hadiths and documents in order to ancient documents that they produced and made up themselves in order to bolster us their political opinions and uh, judicial opinions. Um, a couple of other issues as well is a lot of the hadiths uh, said in order to verify that uh, in order to verify that a Quranic verse, there had to be two witnesses, and and it was blatantly obvious to me, and I I've had no training in it, in hadith studies, but it was absolutely blatantly obvious to me that a lot of the hadiths that I'd read said you have to have two witnesses, two witnesses, two witnesses, and it was very clear to me that 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 was these are later productions, they're not early stories of Islamic history it was blatantly obvious to me that these have been put in in the 8th 9th century or you know by political parties to buttress the the, the Quran as being a divine divine book uh, the reason being that the reason why um, one sees it as not being true is it was they were all exactly the same two witnesses and there was a design within all the hadiths to convince you that every verse had been verified by two witnesses so it had been purposely put in there in history when you're looking at history if people want to convince you a lot of the time um, like if you read the Gospels uh, there's a lot of material in the Gospels that unwittingly show you that it's true they unwittingly show you that it's true for example like the women the women going to the uh, to the resurrection uh, to the tomb you wouldn't put that in if you were trying to convince people you know so, in other words, if the stories of the early compilation of the Quran had things in that were unwittingly there, it would confirm it. The fact that they're putting stuff in to try and prove it is, is proof that it's actually not original. It's actually been put in by in the 8th century. And Ibn Warwick touches on this, that a lot of early 19, 19th century, early 20th century scholars on on hadiths western scholars um i can't remember their names but there, there's a couple there's a couple one or two a couple of <coughs> <coughs> excuse me eminent western hadith scholars western scholars but studying the hadith come to the conclusion that a lot of these hadiths hadiths are like the stories of muhammad and his companions 
a lot of these hadiths actually are a fabrication. And the more stronger it seems to be of a hadith, the more likely it is it's a fabrication. In other words, that the hadith, coll the hadith collectors and writers actually uh, put in stories that, or oh, this is confirmed by such a person, by such a person. So a lot of this, they're confirmed by this person. A lot of it is, it is real lies that people have written these things. And it's just complete lies that they said that this companion can verify the Quran and all that. And when you study it yourself, it's obvious that it is. It come, it, you can get, a, you, it's very clear when you're studying it that people are actually manipulating the evidence to prove a point. So yeah, so it has two witnesses, two witnesses, two witnesses. It's got to be verified by two witnesses. In a lot of the hadiths, and it's clear they're fabrication. They're not. They're not original to the story of the early compilation of the Quran. Um, and and Ibn Warwick and other scholars, scholars bef uh, late nineteenth century, early twentieth century. It's one particular scholar uh, whose name I can't remember. Uh, who was uh, an expert on hadiths came to that conclusion um, so the whole the whole hadith issue which is used to confirm the compilation of the Quran a lot of that source really we can't really use and then there's issues with a couple of issues on the early sources Ibn Ishaq is the earliest biography that we have it was written about a hundred years after Muhammad, uh, but then there's, we don't have his original. It's an edited edition in another writer who came 200 years after Muhammad. So the earliest sources that we have of Muhammad are 200 years after. The hadiths, they're actually different collections of hadiths. By, so like, for example, in Bukhari, Bukhari there are actually different collections of Bukhari. So there are different textual variants within Bukhari. So not only do we have the problem that Bukhari came a couple of hundred years after Muhammad, we have the problem that we don't even know what the original Bukhari collection is because there are textual variants in different collections. So and then on top of that you've got uh, political parties adding uh, chain of narrations in there that are not true um, so a lot of the historical material for Islam is next to worthless really uh, it, it really is um, what else is there Just trying to think what else is there. Um, so, in, in, oh yeah, the, there's another part that I, I, I did some study on, um, but it, it's a different topic really. But um, uh, I won't talk, I won't I won't go into the other topic that I did some research on. But so my conclusion is. Um, that what happened at the beginning of the early Islam from what I've studied so far and I've got a lot a lot to learn and a lot more to, to get into and I want to read Islamic scholars there's a lot of Islamic scholars Shia and Sunni that I need to look at hundreds of scholars that I need to look at which I will do in the coming weeks uh, but basically from what I've studied the primary sources the sources of that these early hadiths stories of which I don't think are actually actually are original a lot of them really to be honest but from Islamic sources basically there was these different fragments all over the place someone had the idea to get them together um, it was put to the people 
Abu Bakr saw that it was a good idea. Umar thought it was a good idea. Sibin Thaid or somebody and somebody else got involved. They were not experts in Arabic. They, one of them possibly was involved in with Muhammad in an in-depth in way in his so-called revelations. But they made a botched job of it. They didn't edit it properly. There was confusion because there was different Qurans around. Uthman got everybody to bring their fragments that they had that were different from everybody else. Made one Quran, burnt all the other evidence, and then told everybody else if they had any different stuff to blot it out and to only have what he'd been, what he'd made. So the Quran that we have today is not the Quran of the time of Muhammad. Second, last thing I want to say as well is this chain, uh, the seven ways of pronunciation. The Muslims say that this is just seven ways of pronouncing. But there are scholars that make it clear that it's not just seven ways of pronouncing. There's very there are clear differences in the hafs and the wash Qurans. But also in other ancient Qurans there are clear differences within uh, uh, clear uh, textual variants. Maybe not major, but there are some clear textual variants. So for one example is where it talks about the creation uh, that the Quran is eternal I can't remember the, qu the the exact quotation the exact verse I can't remember off the top of my head but there is a verse in the Quran that talks about uh, the Quran was created uh, the Quran, Quran was eternal and in the wash and halves that's the textual variant, and the textual variant is um, to do with the uh, uh, I can't remember. Can't, I can't remember. But the the there's um, what was it called? Um, Summit case. There's two. There's two kind of two kind of uh, tenses in each. I, I, I studied it last night, but I can't remember. I actually went into the grammar, I went onto a grammar website, but I, I just can't remember. But there's actually, uh, there's a difference uh, between, between those two Qurans on that particular verse. And it's to do with the noun and the verbs, uh, the, a noun and a verb and uh, whether it's um, a noun is connected to a noun it's quite complicated grammar uh, but it does make a difference so there are minor textual variants like that but there are some bigger textual variants where large portions of the Quran are deemed to be missing and Islamic scholars in the Middle Ages uh, made that point that there were verses missing um, but anyhow, the, the seven recitations that uh, there are scholars that make it clear that there that these recitations are actually in the text textual variants, and we're not talking about we're talking about top top academics in their field, uh, not particularly critical, but who admit that there are textual variants within these so-called recitations. Uh, so my conclusion is that I'll, I'll go into the other topic as well if I've got a bit of time and then i got to go but um, 
I also got in the reading, uh, I got reading uh, the Surah on the life of Joseph and I noticed that as I read that story, it's a quite a long Surah that to me uh, it, it was very similar to the to the Bible story and at the end of the I, I kind of thought well why would Muhammad why would he produce this surah because it's basically generally a lot of it is just the same as the Bible and then it came to me why because at the end at the end of the story it says, believe in the Quran, believe in my revelation. So I, I realized that what Muhammad was doing, he was using these Old Testament stories, telling them, but then saying, I have revealed the Quran. So he was using them to enculturate himself into Jewish and Christian communities. And then assuming a new authority building on an old authority so I found what reading uh, Ibn Warwick this scholar kind of confirms my point because he, he made the point that Patricia Crown and Waynesboro and others also have seen this issue that he was using these stories in order to gain acceptance and not only Muhammad, but his fo the followers and the caliphs later on wanted to gain ground in the Jewish and Christian communities and they were using these kind of stories to give them political weight and power and authority. So, so, I, was, so I was quite uh, also uh, Ibn Warren mentioned that the Joseph story that some scholar, Islamic scholars said it shouldn't be in there. I tried everywhere to find out these Islamic scholars, I couldn't find them. That's how I got reading uh, the story of Joseph in the Quran. Uh, that went, led me to uh, do a bit of historical study because I found that um, that in, on Islamic awareness, there was a very detailed article that said the Quran, the Quran was right in using in the story of Joseph, not fa the word Pharaoh, but king. So it was saying that actually that's more historically accurate about Pharaohs at the time of Joseph because they weren't called Pharaoh, they were called king at the time of Joseph. It was only later that they were called Pharaoh. So I had to do a lot of scholarship and study. I did a lot of study on trying to find out whether this was true or not. And um, the Islamic Awareness website was quite scholarly. There was quite a, a, an in-depth article there. And it was relatively honest. It said that the actual dating of the pharaohs is, is, not, is not like completely set in stone so they were honest about that um, but anyhow I did some study on it and um, the dating actually of the pharaohs uh, is very very difficult so that in itself should make you cautious of making a statement saying that the Bible's wrong um, because we're not talking about a difference of 50 years we're talking a difference of 100 to 300 years of being out in our day dating all right so we should be very very careful when we say the Bible's got it wrong about something uh, and uh, specifically on this issue of the Pharaohs secondly uh, actually in the Bible in Exodus I think chapter 1 it's either chapter 1, chapter 2 or chapter 3 it actually uses the word king for pharaoh as well so it not only uses the word pharaoh in the time of for, for Joseph but it also says king okay so the Quran has not like, in, like got this on its own it's, it's got it from some source and that source is from the bible 
So it could be, it could be that that we either don't know information at the moment, because they say that the word Pharaoh was not used, it was king at the time of Joseph. But, the, but what was interesting, uh, scholars were unanimous and the Islamic awareness actually confirmed it, that the word Pharaoh was used even thousands of years, even a thousand years before Joseph. So it is possible that uh, act the actual pharaohs of uh, the king, uh, sorry, the the leaders of the time of Joseph were, were actually called pharaoh. There is a possibility of that. I don't think we can say that continence that it is not a possibility. It is a possibility. We just might not have the sources or information at the moment. Our earliest inscription puts it about one thirteen maybe a bit later 1013 BC that the word pharaoh is used as a reference to a king whereas Christian scholars put the time of Joseph I think 1600 1700 BC um, so yeah I, I think that there's a possibility that the Bible is correct, that the, we might find an inscription that shows it actually they were called Pharaoh in the time of Joseph and not just king. But even if we don't, uh, Moses mentions Pharaoh as king sometimes. Um, so it could be that Moses was writing to his community about the past of Joseph using the term pharaoh because it would be a term in his day they would understand or it could be that it's actually historically accurate about the time um, I think it's probably historically accurate to be honest the reason being is because the the biblical story has been confirmed to be actually historical at the time, we found inscriptions, ancient uh, inscriptions concerning uh, the way prisons were set up, Moses was in prison, uh, and it matches what the biblical account says. We found inscriptions of um, slave trading, which match, matches exactly concerning the story of Joseph. Also, the Quran is inaccurate, it talks about uh, in the time of Joseph there was shekels, uh, sorry, drachmas, like a Greek kind of uh, money, uh, coins. So the coins weren't around in those times. So the Quran is clearly unhistorical. And anything that's in the Quran is clearly borrowed from the Bible. And the Bible has clear historical verification that it is in the time of these Egyptian. Uh, pharaohs because we, we can we found uh, Egyptian descriptions of pr the way prisons are worked similar to Joseph's story we found inscriptions about the pharaoh at uh, the uh, slave trading similar to the issue of uh, the story of Joseph etc so so yeah so that's but I had to do a lot of work to be able to debunk Islamic awareness. It took a lot of study to get to that point. It, it was not easy. So that's it really. I hope that's been a help to you. Um, this video is for Muslims who are open to be questioned and challenged. It, it's for Christians to encourage them. And, it, and it's for Christian apologists just to give you some ideas of directions of where to do your studies. And I just hope my research and my thinking will open your mind to think about the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to go and get to the doctors and get a repeat prescription and I've got to do some printing. So thank you for listening and God bless you. Take care. God bless you. Love you all. God bless.